the learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about how cell theory was reached by scientists, what is cell theory exactly, what are some exceptions to cell theory, and then we're going to talk about the two main types of cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and how they are similar and different. And then finally we'll end up on the role of this little molecule called ATP inside of cells. So cell theory itself starts with the men of the microscopes. The first gentleman we're going to talk about is named Anton von Leeuwenhoek. At least I think that's how you say his name. I'm probably going to screw up all the names for this, so don't assume I'm saying them correctly. Uh, he was a scientist in the 1600s, uh, credited with making over 500 different types of microscopes. This is an example of one of his microscopes here in the bottom right. You can see it looks like a flat paddle with a little lens right here, and then you would put a slide or something on this little spike here and twist it until it got over the lens. And uh, he especially liked looking at pond water where he described himself as seeing wee beasties or small little beasts. You can see a sketch of his there on the left hand side and then an actual microscopic picture of the same basic organism on the right so his observation skills were pretty good. Uh, so again he saw lots of different things in pond water, pond water. Excuse me. Around the same time another gentleman by the name of Robert Hooke was also using the microscope. Again his was a bit different but more in line with what you would see today with modern microscopes. He liked to look especially at plants, um, plant stems, wood, and cork. Now, cork is just dead wood, really. And inside of things, especially the cork, he saw these tiny little chambers that he called cells. The story goes that they reminded him of a monastery with all these little rooms for the monks, so they were called cells for the monks, and so he called them cells. So what was he actually observing? Well, he was actually observing the cell wall of the cork, the dead plant. So this is the famous sketch from Robert Hooke. You can see in this side especially, they look like little tiny cells, very structured, very organized. And again, it's just dead cork, so there's no organelles, there's nothing inside. It was just the cell wall that was left over. So all this is just cell wall. Uh, he also observed lots of other little guys, again, like leaving Hooke's uh, wee beasties, these little guys and he was obviously a very good artist. In the 1800s another gentleman by the name of Robert Brown observed that cells had this weird dark structure within their uh, in themselves especially within plant cells. It, basically he was the first gentleman to observe in detail the nucleus of a cell. Another gentleman around the same time and I'm gonna really mess up this name Matthias Schleiden if I'm saying it wrong, I'm sorry, uh, around 1838 finally had done enough observation of plants as well to conclude that all plants were made up of cells. Every single time he looked at a plant he saw cells and he liked to look at plants very much in the early stages of their lives when they were just starting to grow and he always noticed that plants always started from a single cell. <clears throat> Then another gentleman with the microscopes, Theodore Schwann, he actually has a type of cell named after him called Schwann cells, uh, stated that all animals were made up of cells as well. So his work has specialized in animal tissue. Uh, and you can see, of course, the different types of animal cells. You have red blood cells on the left. I'm not sure if those are just basic skin cells on the right, I think. And then finally, you get Rudolf Virchow, who stated that all cells must come from pre-existing cells, i.e. cells must come from other cells before them, and that the cells arise from the division of these cells. So again, you can only get new cells from older cells. So this gives us a combined idea of the whole thing that is called cell theory, and it has three main parts. The idea that all living things, be it plant, animal, uh, bacteria, whatever, if it's alive, it's composed of cells. Second, that cells are the basic unit of structure and function in living things. And third, again, all cells must come from pre-existing cells. Doesn't matter what kind of living thing it is. So, let's talk about some exceptions to cell theory, because cell theory is good, but it's not perfect. There's always some weird little exceptions with biology. So viruses, over here on the right we have a little macrophage, 
right here. Viruses are not made of cells. They can, however, reproduce and they can evolve. So are they alive? Well, it depends on how strictly you describe, you subscribe to the idea of cell theory. If you say that only things that are made of cells are alive, then technically viruses are not alive. However, if you, stalk, if you talk to anybody who studies viruses, they will very much tell you that viruses work and behave like living things. From their perspective, they are alive. So it's kind of a wishy-washy and it depends on who you ask. Another weird exception to cell theory are mitochondria and chloroplasts, these two guys here and here. They're um, weird little exceptions because each of them actually has their own DNA and they reproduce on their own. This has led many scientists to suspect that they in fact were um, originally independent organisms that were that were um, ingested by larger cells. It's a theory called endosymbiotic theory. It's interesting, you should look it up if you wish. But the idea that these guys can actually reproduce on your own, but they're not technically cells, makes them kind of stand out to cell theory people. So cell theory is what helps us to divide the three main branches of all living things. So you have two different separations. I'll just draw a line here. You have the eukaryotic branch over here, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then over here is the prokaryotes. Now these are all cells, and again, eukaryotes here. These are all cells, uh, cellular-based life forms. But there is some interesting differences. So, <clears throat> first off, there's the matter of size. Eukaryotes are big by comparison to prokaryotes. You can see the eukaryote over here and the prokaryote over here. The reason for the size difference, well, the eukaryotes have organelles. The prokaryotes have no organelles. So let's do some listing on this to make this easier. So as I said, the eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles, things like the nucleus, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, that's ER here, have vesicles. Prokaryotes have no membrane-bound organelles. They have a nucleoid region where DNA likes to hang out, but it's actually not a true nucleus. There's no Golgi apparatus, no ER, nothing of that nature at all. The size difference, again, the eukaryotes have to be bigger, so they actually have room for all these organelles. They are on a range of about 10 to 100 micrometers, and the prokaryotes are only 1 to 10 micrometers. A micrometer is this many meters, much, much, much smaller. Uh, structurally speaking, yeah, it should be pretty obvious from this point that eukaryotes are going to be more complex. They simply have more stuff in them, and prokaryotes are structurally simpler by comparison. Examples from the Seven Kingdoms concept of uh, life, well, bacteria, or eubacteria, and the domain archaea all are prokaryotic cells. They do not have nucleuses at all. Whereas protists, plants, funguses, and animals all have organelles such as the nucleus, mitochondria, Golgi, ER, vesicles, chloroplasts if they're plants or, um, or uh, protists in some case. So I've color-coded these lists for a very specific reason because the prokaryotes are exclusively unicellular. They can live in colonies of up to many, several billions. They can get you know, huge numbers, but they're all unicellular, and each cell is independent of the other, can exist without the others in the colony. Whereas most eukaryotes are multicellular. Protists are the weird exception. That's why they're in blue. Protists can sometimes be unicellular. Protists, we can talk about later with classification, they are almost the exception to every single rule you make about biology. And so again, the three domains of life, you have the eukaryotes here with the organelles, so eukaryotes here, and then these guys over here, the bacteria, the eubacteria and the archaea, these are the prokaryotes, no organelles. So 
uh, pictorially speaking, I like to show this because it kind of emphasizes the point. Again, this is a prokaryote. You can see in the picture there's no nucleus. There's just a nucleoid region. It does have cytoplasm, does have ribosomes, uh, does have these little pili or flagella to help this guy move around, does have a cell wall, a cell membrane, and an outside called in a capsule. But it's pretty structurally simple by comparison a eukaryote, which has a lot of different things you should have learned about in middle school. Again, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, chloroplasts, um, vesicles, mitochondria, all that stuff. And while there is a size difference between the two, they do have some similarities. Again, they both have cell membranes. They both can have a cell wall, not always, but they both can have a cell wall. They both have cytoplasm, the, the, the uh, medium by which everything is sitting in, the fluid inside. Uh, they both can have ribosomes. Uh, DNA and RNA is essential for all life, so they both have that. And depending on the type of bacterium or the type of uh, eukaryote, they can have sometimes chlorophyll, not chloroplast, just the chlorophyll chemical. And you can see in this picture the size difference. This is the eukaryote, this is the prokaryote, and over here is a little tiny virus. So again, you can see there's a massive differences in, difference in size between these three. All right, wrapping up finally, let's get on to cellular energy, i.e. what powers a cell. Now, the best way to think of cellular energy is to think of it like a form of currency. Thinking of it like cash is really the best way to understand cellular energy. Just like with cash, you can exchange energy inside of the cell to get work done. You want to move a vesicle from point A to point B, you have to spend some energy. You have to spend some of your cash if you're a cell. So the cash of a cell is this little molecule called adenosine triphosphate. Do not let the name scare you. Uh, this is the chemical layout of adenosine triphosphate. It does have three major parts that we'll simplify in just a minute. Uh, adenosine triphosphate is typically known as ATP. Now there's a picture of this in your book as well. I suggest you take a good look at it. The key part of ATP is going to be over here on this left side. So I would recommend getting a picture or copy of a picture from either your book or from this uh, presentation down of what ATP looks like just so you can recognize the three main parts. But again, the adenosine, the ribose, and then tri, one, two, three, let's make that a two and a three, triphosphate. So triphosphate, adenosine triphosphate. Now, the way ATP loses energy, the way the energy gets spent, is by breaking apart the high energy bonds between the second and the third phosphate, the one right here where this guy is pointing. When we break that bond, that chemical bond, energy is released, a lot of energy. And so that energy can be used for all different types of things inside of the cell. The energy can be used to do chemical work, such as chemical reactions, mechanical work, making muscles contract or um, relaxed. Uh, it can be used for transportation work against a concentration gradient, so moving things where they normally wouldn't go on their own. So ATP is the cash of the cell. Without ATP, the cell can't get done any of the stuff it needs to get done. So on the left side of this picture, we have ATP. Again, we break this bond right here to release the energy, and when we break that bond, as you can see in this next picture, we get a whole bunch of energy and what we're left with is another little chemical called ADP. This is adenosine di, di meaning two phosphate. So adenosine diphosphate and a single phosphate guy all by himself because that bond is now broken. So adenosine triphosphate is where the energy is stored. That's energy ready to be spent. That's cash in hand ready to go. Adenosine diphosphate is basically cash that's been spent. It's useless. It has no practical value. The thing is, the cell can actually recycle ADP back into ATP through various means. We'll talk about that later when we hit cellular respiration. But it is an important thing to remember that this version 
is the one the cell can use to actually get work done. This version is just the spent version. So we have reactants on the left. Before reaction happens, before you have to spend energy to get something done in the cell, and then you have after the reaction. Thank you for listening, guys. If you have any questions, make sure you ask me during class.